Hey everyone and welcome to another episode of Aussie Tech Heads. It's episode 609, recorded on the 8th of November 2018. How are you doing? My name's Glenn Goodman and we have another great show for you this week. Plenty of stories, plenty of chit-chat, uh, plenty of things to talk about. So uh, we'll get straight into it in a second. But we are brought to you, the production costs are paid for by athwebhosting.com.au. So if you like what you see on the podcast, please go ahead and uh, drop them a line, sign up with some web hosting at athwebhosting.com.au webhosting.com.au you've got server side ssd drives immediate activation ssl certificates all the all the good jazz and all the good stuff to keep your site up and running and respectable throughout the internet and your business community and also start new company.com.au speaking of companies and business communities you can register your company fast easy and direct with asic all docs are provided and held in your account for download at any time in the future. If you're accountant, if you are an accountant or other professional, you are also able to brand all your documents in your own name. How good is that? Good stuff. Startnewcompany.com.au. Uh, we are on the Facebook, facebook.com for, uh, but yeah, facebook.com forward slash Aussie Tech Eds and youtube.com forward slash Aussie Tech Eds. Show notes every week are at aussietechheads.com.au forward slash podcast. Other shows on the network, Aussie Max Zone, My Tech Opinion. And we welcome this week's co host, Joe the Gadget Man. Hey, Joe, how are you going? I'm good, thanks, Glenn. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Uh, what's been happening in your week? Anything exciting? Oh, mate, I've been busy setting up things for this little. Um thing that I'm venture I'm working on on the Joe the Gadget Man. Oh yes, yes. Can you elaborate or is it a is it shrouded in secrecy? Well it's not a big secret. I'm 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 doing some work with uh, Amazon store. I want to open up a little Amazon store eventually. Nice. So I'm doing some work there and I'm just going through some importing of some um, some products. So right. good stuff. I'm looking at that at the moment. All right. Well, I'll be uh, eager to see how that progresses and how you uh, set your store up and and the, yeah, the results of all that. That sounds exciting. I did. Uh, I have uh, seen how something similar to that works. There's a there's a a uh, website called Flipper. I think it's called dot com, uh, and it's all about uh, people uh, set up little Amazon stores and web pages that link into the store for people to buy stuff, and then uh, essentially they just sell their websites. Like you've you've heard of flipping houses and so forth. Well, this is like this flipper dot com is something like flipping websites that are all pre built and yeah yeah I've seen that yeah that's that's a uh, they they flip all sorts of things there. Yeah, domain names and and whatnot. I'll see if I can get it up on the. On the on the internet, so we can have a so people can have a bit of a look at those on the video. Yeah, so the, anyone who actually wants to get a, a website that's already up and running, that's a good idea to save you a lot of a lot of time and effort. So you just they're already pre-built. There's something that you like, you can actually go in there and um, offer or buy something that um, is already pre-done. Yes, and, uh, it, it, it saves you a lot of time and effort. Yeah, so there's one here. If you're in e-commerce, let's pop into e-commerce and have a look. There we go. There's a yeah. As you say, as the listings get higher in value, you find that they're private. You've got to ask for access. But here's one here that's uh, open and, and ready to roll. Oktoberfestcostumes.com.au. So it's an e-commerce. The revenue's fifteen thousand three hundred fifty-eight dollars. That must be a year, you'd imagine. The profit six and a half thousand. Asking price twenty-five thousand. So if you're sitting at home wanting something to do. Uh, other than drinking beer on the lounge, you might be able to, you know, jump into the flipper.com and see what you can find. You know, put put those uh, put those elbows to uh, punching keys instead of downing beers. Not as much fun, but anyway, <laughs> that's that's how it works. Yeah, so that's flipper.com if you ever have a look at that. Um, what else has been going on, Joe? Anything exciting? Nothing. It's been a uh, pretty slow story week again. Um, uh, nothing. The, much. Um the soccer's been on again, so I was up earlier this morning watching the Manchester United and Juventus game. That was a good game. Right. How are you watching that? Because I know there's, off of years, I've heard about problems watching soccer. So how is that being broadcast this time? That's uh, that's uh, the Champions League that was being played this morning, and that was going through Optus Sport. Right, right. So that means what, you have to have what opt, some Optus gadget to uh, to watch it? Yeah, anyone that's got um, you know a mobile phone, they can download the app to Optus Sport, or they can um, subscribe via a website, and you can watch it on your computer. Right. Okay. Or, can... or if you actually got the um, Optus service at home via cable or DSL, you can then, or even NBN actually, you can even then subscribe and get the uh, Fetch TV box. 
which comes up with um, it's a, it's an internet sort of service. Right, and can you uh, Chromecast it? Um, from the I app? believe Chromecasting is still not supported. I haven't tried it in the last month or two, but a t- couple of months ago it wasn't supported. You'll get some sound coming through, but you won't get no picture. So I'm not sure. Mm. What's the go there? I think that uh, sounds like it's yeah, it's blocked somehow. Uh, yeah, it's not supported. Is that are you trying to cast from an Apple or an Android device? Must be an Android. You're an Android, aren't you? I'm an Android, but I've actually got a, a Fetch TV box uh, supplied by Optus, so that's not a problem for me. Mm, okay, so that's good. Uh, I know the cricket that start. Oh look, I didn't even know it started. There was a one day international the other day. Uh, I don't know. You sort of you miss things when they're not on free to wear, don't you? Uh, that's so the, right, yeah, Optus has also got the cricket. Um, so yeah. they're pretty much what have they like got Fox Sports? Is that what it's coming through? Uh, Fox Sport is actually run by Foxtel, and that's uh, on the, on the Telstra side of things. So right. most of the soccer that we're watching today in on Optus did belong to Foxtel and then Optus came along and um, put a bid in for it and now they've got the rights to it for the next few years. Mm. The Premier League is one of those things as well. Right. It's all changing around, isn't it? Like it's 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 strange or well, it's it's funny to watch how it changed like the Channel Nine's had cricket for forty odd years or so. Uh, and then now so Channel Nine loses the cricket and then they for some somehow they've just managed to cobble enough money together and now they've got the tennis instead. I don't know what Channel 7's got. Well, so they've lost the tennis. They haven't got the cricket. Or have I they got the Foxtel cricket? Foxtel has the, the rugby league. The, um, the Foxtel have the, the, has the NRL. Yeah. So you can only watch NRL if, you watch, if you've got the um, Foxtel. Yes, that's right. Yeah, some of the games. But does Channel 7, do they do some of free-to-wear cricket? I don't know. I've been I've been out of the cricket for a little while because uh, I haven't been paying. Well, it's, you know, it's only just started. I have to get back into it. But I downloaded the Foxtel cricket app, so I'm sure I'll start getting some notifications when games start playing. And, yeah, we'll uh, view it. What do they call it? The viewer feedback, the viewer decision tool. You know, you sit there and you decide whether that's in or out. That's, that's what I like doing. <laughs> I don't know. I never watch the cricket, so I'm not into that. All right. Uh, all right. Let's get into some good stuff, some juicy stuff. Uh, look, we'll start with, I don't know, this may be a bit boring, but just this one is just probably just for your information, I guess. Uh, Amazon Web Services reveals EC2 instances that based on AMD chips. Now, it's probably something you don't really think about, is it? Like, and then if you did think about it, you probably think, oh, yeah, it's probably all Intel chips, you'd imagine. You know, that's just the way of the world. But anyway, these uh, instances will be available in three variants on the existing EC2 platform the r5 and the m5 instances can be launched from the aws management console or command line interface while amd based t3 instances will also be available down the line the r5 and m5 instances will be available in six sizes going up to 69 virtual cpus providing up to 70 768 gig of memory so you know these are instances they can provide you with a lot of computing power so uh, all the instances can be uh, purchased on demand and reserved or in spot instances. So if you haven't really had a go at Amazon's, what they've got to offer, you can, you can jump on and have a bit of a go for free. Uh, it's uh, probably a bit of a uh, slow and steady introduction because the, the, the instances that they give you aren't really that powerful. But it's places like you, you could, an instance is say pretty much, I don't know, what would you say, like a, be like your computer, okay? So you, you load up, you, you go to Amazon, buy a computer. It's a virtual computer. And then you just pump on whatever you want, like Linux or um, a Minecraft server, or you could probably stick a Windows in there, whatever you wanted to do. And it's just your little computer in the cloud. So, uh, yeah, they're designed, these new ones, they're designed to be used, the AMD ones are designed to be used for workloads that don't use all of the compute power available and provide you with a new opportunity to optimise your instance mix based on cost performance. So the AW, the AMD chips are a little less expensive, so the infrastructure and whatnot is built around those, and so that offers you a cheaper a cheaper way of doing things. So that's all good. Sounds good to me. Uh, if you're not, you know, power user, power user, you probably want to make sure you're on an Intel one. The AMD based instances will be available from today in some instances in the Asia Pacific and the US and Ireland. Uh, but the Amazon stressed that they aren't replacing Intel with AMD. So that's just, uh, what do you think about that, Joe? Any any thoughts or just, oh yeah, that's that's nice? It, it's that's- interesting how they're, 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 they're doing their Amazon web services 
I heard a story as I was listening to another podcast a couple of days ago on how and and how Amazon actually decided that you know how they got the the Amazon shop right. Yeah. Um, they never at, they start Amazon started with the Amazon shop, and then all of a sudden they uh, they had this thing called Black Friday. Yeah. Was it, yeah. Black Friday. Yes. So um, that was very popular. So what happens is that they never had enough bandwidth. So what they ended up doing was they ended up creating these little little farms, these little server farms, to be able to cater for all the um, all the all the bandwidth that they needed for those Black Friday sales. Yes. Yeah. They're- so that were, that only came around once a year. So therefore, what did they have uh, all these servers and everything sitting around for? Doing nothing, so they decided they would start implementing some um, some parts of it to other people, and started selling bits and pieces of, it and started upgrading the infrastructure. Mm. And you know, in a nutshell, basically, that's how the Amazon got their um, Amazon Web Services about. For that reason, it came about because of that. Yeah, right. Because I remember quite some time ago, I downloaded a cloud desktop. It was just like a little computer up there, you know, a virtual computer. And as the internet got faster and faster, all these things came, became more more uh, applicable for everyday use. And yeah, but that, the, the AWS stuff is, is really good. You log into them and you have a look at all the services that they offer. It's mind-blowing. Like they, I don't know how many they got, but they've got like three columns. Must be about 15 services in each column. It's just amazing. Uh, I, don't, I only use the storage uh, part of it. So there's a called an S3 storage <clears throat> where you, you purchase things or you create buckets and you just dump all your data in there. Uh, I've got it so like the web server backs up into a bucket on AWS and that's good for me because the the backup of everything is not on the same server or in the same location or even uh, you know in the same location as the actual s- the server and all the data for the website so if a bomb hit the server I've still got the backups so yeah so the that's pretty cool I like the Amazon I know you know you got the Microsoft Azure and the Google cloud services or whatever they got they're all pretty much the same i think um just you know whatever your cup of tea is i haven't seen the google one yet apparently the google's got one um uh, yeah microsoft and i think amazon are the better ones at the moment yeah. google one um seems to be lacking a bit in that area um they're more to do with the search engines and, and stuff like that but with with other services um like cloud services I believe Amazon and Microsoft is also very up up there with, with it as well. Yeah, so the thing that turned look, I was I think I mentioned a few maybe a few months ago, I was ready to go all in on Google, you know, the G Suite and all this sort of stuff. But you can't talk to them. You send off a support request. They send me they send you a, a you know promotion email or, or you know business seeking email and saying yeah sign up with us. We got this. We got that. We got that. So I send them back a question asking a simple question about their product. You don't hear from them. I think it took them. Uh, it must have been about a month to get back to me. Well, well, you, I just... you must have been using the wrong wrong way of communication. Just this week, I was um, trying to set up G Suite because um, mm. I've got you know obviously JoeTheGadgetsMan dot com website, and I wanted to have it hosted all my emails via the the G Suite. So I went there and I registered and um, set it all up. And if you have a little icon on the corner there for support, if you click on it, it's like a desktop support it just pops up and the guy that I spoke to came to me within minutes. Yeah, okay. Well, I hadn't actually signed up. I had a question pre-sales. Um, ah, yeah. okay. Well, that's different. I mean, I actually signed up. Um, there was no fee for signing up, but there's a 14-day trial period if you use G Suite. And I, I, I linked all my um, email addresses from Joe the Gadget Man mm. via that. I, I just – because I don't know if you remember last week I was talking about the different email programs – that I could use um, yes. to get or to keep them all, all together. Yep, and and I believe you found something. I have found something. I didn't go with G Suite. Simple reason being is that it, it was going to be a fairly expensive, you know, thing. I mean, you you have to pay something like uh, five dollars per email to use it. Mm, sure, that's you, right. you can set up aliases, um, but I wanted to keep everything separate. So. It all came in on its own little in little channel, and I can keep an eye on it. Like I've got yeah. seven or eight different emails. Yeah. So I ended up doing that, um, and uh, after uh, a, a few hours, you know, six seven hours of, of using it and setting it up, I decided, mm, no, nah, this is not for me. 
So I, I ended up looking at Thunderbird. Right, yes. That's the one that Jordan recommended last week. Yep. That that looked pretty good. Um, that also did everything I wanted it to do, but the interface on it looked a bit, you know, 90s. Yes. So it was a bit... <laughs> So I decided that I, I, I didn't go with that. And the other thing was, um, from memory, it didn't have support for antivirus. Well, not the one that oh. I'm using anyway, the, um, the Nod32. I, I used Nod32 antivirus. Yes. So the Thunderbird, I don't think, had support for that virus. So I couldn't use it as well oh. for that reason. I mean, you've got to have antivirus when just with your email. Yeah, yeah. So, what, so the Nod... It, it, you mean it just wouldn't integrate in? It wouldn't. It wouldn't cleanse the mail as it as it came. Correct. Through. Yeah. So I was basically getting mail, with, but it wasn't being checked for viruses or anything like that. So mm. um, I, I, I didn't go with that. So what did you end up with? I ended up with a with a software called um, EM Client. Right. Okay. Tell us about that. EM Client is um, a subscription based software as well. And it integrates with the G Suite, and it integrates with Google, and integrates with all different types of um, email systems, Outlook. Um, oh yeah, Apple. Know, it, it has got a nicer look. But, you know, if you look at it, it's got a nice interface. And um, I found that the uh, the email the e, e, EM client. Um, just worked a, lot, a little bit better than than the others, so I, I continued to start using it. And the thing with this particular program is that if you're using the EM client, the license is per computer. So you can might have ten emails that you're using, and say you want to use it on your laptop, that's fine. That's one one license. Yep. But if you hop over to your desktop and you want to use it on your desktop, you have to get another license for that. Oh right. Right. So, what are the licenses? Are they expensive? Well, not really. I, I for a year it was like seventy two dollars for two licenses, seventy two right. Australian dollars. Do they include like if you bought a desktop license, would they include a mobile license? Um, mobile license, they don't actually have mobile licenses as such. You actually just done uh, use one of the. Uh, well, I, I don't. I don't think they actually got their own little. Life, they got their own little. I don't think they have their own app for it at the moment. Oh, right, right. Because you wanted the main reason you went out searching for something was so you could get all your accounts to display emails all in the one screen uh, on the desktop, isn't it? That's right. Yeah, that was my main my main objective was to get all the emails coming into one spot on one browser or one app or whatever it was, and then from there. It was just a matter of, okay, um, I want to check this email and see if I've got mail, or I want to check that mail and see if it's got mail, mm. um, without having to you know, flip through different screens here and there. So why didn't the why didn't uh, Gmail or Mail help you out? Because I think I remember talking to you about the, that. Gmail, it, it does that, right? But um, – it's five dollars per month per user, and if I got seven of those emails, mm. that's thirty-five dollars a month. But, but every that, month for checking mail, no, nah, I don't think so. What about the the free version? Though you could you could select the all mail, like that wasn't what you wanted. No, the free version. See, the, there's the difference with the G Suite. G Suite allows you to register your own domain emails. That's right. Yes. Yes. Right, where where the free version of Google only lets you use something with a dot uh, gmail dot com. Yeah. So why, uh, so then why why is that a issue for you? Because like the way mine's set up is that I've got say the Aussie Tech Heads and whatever the Aussie Mac Zone and the ADH web hosting. So all emails sent to those domains forward into my free Gmail. And then I can go all email or whatever, and all, they all appear in the inbox. That's right, but they're not split up. I mean, I, I wanted to have them all split up. Uh, Chris right, says that Not32 right. does work with Thunderbird. Okay, mm. I didn't, I, I couldn't get it to work, or I didn't see it. So I might have to have another look. But I've started um, using EM mail, EM client now. Yeah, yeah, okay. So um, 
Yeah, so Chris is on the Facebook. Hi, Chris. So each week when Jordan's around, and I'll, I'll tell you where Jordan is in a minute, uh, we uh, we stream live to Facebook. So if you've got any questions out there, uh, I forgot to put up before this week's show, if anyone on Facebook had some questions to ask or some stories that you wanted us to talk about, that I should, I'm not sure if Facebook can do uh, uh, weekly scheduled post i'll have a look into that because i I forget half the time about these things but uh but i'll look into that but uh jordan he's uh he's got a birthday party he had to attend to so he's kindly came in set up the facebook live and uh taken off to the party so uh it won't be too long before i'll be able to do facebook live from here as when i get some faster internet uh still at least i'm up five up now it's uh it's getting faster but uh i think i'm scheduled nbn for January to March, so it's coming, Joe. It's coming. It's just uh, yep. it's a long time coming, but it's coming. Uh, all right. Uh, yeah. So you're happy with your your EM client? See how that goes. Uh, look, the fun. Yeah, I'm going to see how it goes. I mean, I'll give it a, a go for a, a couple of months, and again, if it doesn't work, I might go back to um, Christopher was saying that he's been using Thunderbird for years, and he says he he reckons it does work with Nod32. Right. Uh, I, I didn't see anything in the program or I didn't see it linked in with my Nod32. So I may have missed it because I was just too you know, involved in trying to get it to work. So hmm. uh, if, if my EM client doesn't work, I'll go back to uh, – does it work for me? I'll go back to have another look at Thunderbird. Hmm. Yeah, I remember Thunderbird. I used that years and years ago. But, um, yeah, look, I'm, I'm – Look, if you if you don't have any success with all that, I'm sure you could you can configure Gmail to do what you wanted. You might have to, you know, like um, I, like you wanted all the emails on the one screen, or you could have them uh, segregated into say folders, so you could look at each one individually. Well, you could do that. You can achieve that, uh, but it's just you just got to set it up a little bit. Um, all right, let's go. Uh, what what did you find, Joe? What did you want to talk about this week? What excitement tech news did you find? Well, I'm just going on what we were talking about last week um, with eSIMs, right? Mm. Um, like with the SIM cards where you've got uh, dual SIMs where one's an eSIM and one's not. Yes. Apparently, um, for those that don't know, um, the eSIMs are what they call embedded SIMs. Um, and they um, does everything that a normal SIM can do. Uh, a normal SIM card stores information that authenticates your identity on your phone um, with the carrier and tells them what you're subscribed to, on which plan and on what network it is. Right, right. So um, now, without a, without one of these uh, SIM cards, obviously you can't make phone calls or send texts or mobile data. So um, if you wanted to, you normally have to change SIM cards in, um, in your phone. Yes. So you can see there, as you, the picture that's up on the, the YouTube there, you can see all the different type of SIMs cards. Now, the eSIM, you can see, wow. it's just like a little dot, maybe half the size of a, a grain of um, rice. It's, yeah. very, it's very small. <laughs> it's, a, it's a HP pencil lead piece of lead, isn't it? About the size of that. Yeah, it's very it's small. Very big. So, and and what the and that's going to be what's been happening in the future. They're going to start replacing your normal SIM cards with one of those things. Mm, geez, you're losing those. Yeah. Now the new, the new Apple phones and the Apple watches have already got the eSIM. Right. But the way they're set up is in such a way that you can only use the existing phone number, so it transfers the existing phone number. Right. I'm guessing that's something to do with the firmware or with the setup, the way they've got it. Mm. But that'll probably change. Everything changes over time, doesn't it? Like that, they come out with new things and different ways to do stuff. Yeah. But, uh, so the other thing as well with these eSIMs, which people might not know about, because um, in America, they're fairly popular. A lot of phones and a lot of phone companies are using these eSIMs. So these eSIMs are basically are rewritable. Right. Which Just... means you can actually um, switch phone carriers um, with a couple of taps on the screen. So you can reprogram the SIM. Right. And so, you can start using a different service provider without changing the card or without going into the shops and getting a new card or, or anything like that. It's just, it's all software driven. Yes. So the prices, I was just reading here that they look like they're $42 just for the SIM uh, with the cost of the prepaid plan charged on top. So I guess um, 
It's new, isn't it? Anything new costs you money. It's not like, I think, what normal Sims, uh, my, what have we got now? Nano Sims, Micro Sims. They're, they're about two bucks, yeah, aren't they? Yeah, we've got the Micro Sims. Yeah. Yeah, so that's uh, that's interesting how you can read, write, and that, that's pretty cool. That is good. Like, if you only need one SIM card, and then you... Yeah, that's good. What's it say here? The catch is that... Yeah, so yeah, you, you said that, then you're supported by both the handset and the carrier. Australia doesn't support them yet. But I wish, the thought of customers being able to switch between carriers so easily has scared away Optus, Telstra, and Vodafone. <laughs> right. Fair enough. Yeah. So for, for those who still don't understand what I'm trying to trying to say with about these eSIMs, um, before um, Netflix was around, you had to go to a physical store to pick up a movie, walk out, pay for it, and that's right. bring it back. Um, and that's what you have, basically have to do now with a SIM card. You have to, if you want to change your SIM card, you have to go in there, pick it up, get a new one. But apparently now all these new electronic eSIMs is embedded, stands for embedded. An embedded sim, yes, um, it's completely digital. Um, and you don't have to do any of that. You don't have to go to the shop. And if you decide that you want to change your plan, the software is on your on your phone already, and you just go in and you change it. Because I remember it wasn't too long ago when we had a power outage that you know lost the internet and everything, and I was you know pretty keen to get the internet so I could keep working. Uh, so I thought oh, I'll pull out my little Vodafone. Um, MiFi, whatever they call them, you know, the little portable Wi-Fi things. And so yeah. I pulled that out. And I thought, oh, okay, it's had the Vodafone SIM in it. And I thought, oh, okay, I'll just ring up Vodafone and get just recharge it, you know. But I couldn't. They said, oh, if it's more than 12 months out of charge, that's it. You've got to go down the shop and buy another SIM card. So I, if that's a little issue that will be taken care of with these... Uh, How long ago was that? Uh, that would have been six months ago. Oh, Okay. Well, you, you do know now, rather than getting one of those little things, if there's there's enough data on people's plans at the moment that you can actually just hotspot your, your phone and just use that. Well, I did I, I could, but what I was trying to do was... Um, see, once... I've, I've sort of come overcome the problem now. I've, I've gone... I've fixed it up completely. But, uh, see, once the internet goes down, the entire network goes... My entire network goes down. So then... And if I hotspot the phone... Then the hotspot, without me mucking around with everything, the hotspot sort of the the hotspot becomes the network, the the available network on the computer. So therefore, it ignores the LAN. You know, it, it doesn't it doesn't use it doesn't just see still see the LAN and allow the internet to come through from the hotspot. So that was my issue, and I didn't want to start mucking around trying to you know bind it all together because it was only going to be out for probably a day or so, or maybe five days in this case. But at the end of the day, I fixed it up, and I think this is where the whole place is going now because these are becoming po as popular as, as uh, sliced bread. Is that you know your modem with the four G backup, and uh, even with NBN, I know I've got the Telstra one. So I got an email the other day. the The internet went out, and the four G SIM kicked in. I got an email from the modem. It must have been saying that the four G SIM had kicked in. Uh, still got the internet. Uh, it'll just automatically switch back over when. You know, the land comes back, the, the the WAN comes back. So, you know, so those things are good. I know other carriers, other ISPs are pulling out uh, or offering modems that you can plug in, SIM cards and dongles and all this to do the same sort of thing. So I think that's where it's going. So, yeah, of course. I mean, I, when I bought my home router, um, it would have been more than, a, it would have been about two, three years ago I bought it. Um, that came with an option where, it, it had an automatic cutover to 4G. You know, you just get, you know, yeah. a SIM, pretty much like what you did, just mm. put a SIM in there. So you just leave it in there and it automatically cuts over. Um, I actually tried it with my phone once. I disconnected the the modem and just ran the um, the phone and it just automatically cut over Yep. and uh, away you went. But that was part of the router itself, not the one that the customer, not the one that the provider gave me, the one I bought myself. Yeah, because I did have one of those routers that I could have put a, a dongle into it, but I had the same issue was that it wasn't charged for more than 12 months or so. So I had all these SIM cards and dongles, uh, but because nothing was charged for over 12 months, they I couldn't, char I had to make, I had to go to the shop if I wanted to do it, and I didn't want to do that, so... I threw well, my hands the way to in go here. is get an eSIM. It'd be easy to update. Just pay your money and away you go. Yeah, well, that's what the sounds like. So, uh, yeah, bring on the eSIM. Good stuff. 
Now, uh, I, I can move on with a Telstra story if, that, if you're finished there, Joe. Yep, go for it. Uh, there's been a Telstra fault uh, through last week that's taken down FPOS and ATMs. So I didn't didn't experience it, didn't impact my life any, but I'm sure it impacted a lot of everyone else's. There was a nationwide Telstra network outage starting last Friday and has left merchants unable to use their EFT terminals for sales transactions and bank customers unable to withdraw cash from the ATMs. Now, Telstra Enterprise said on social media that the fault is within its machine-to-machine data services network with FPOS terminals and ATMs being affected. Well... The outage has been blamed on faulty vendor equipment. Maybe uh, ageing vendor equipment might have been the the right word or the, the El Cheapo version of vendor equipment. But anyway, that has since been replaced. Telstra did not say what the equipment was or name the vendor in question. Uh, the story went on and said taxis had to ask for cash instead of uh, instead of taking cards. Oh, my God. We're going back to the dark ages. I don't, I don't think they'd be complaining about that. No. <laughs> they'd be happy. They'd be saying, oh, we should just uh, take this Telstra out all the time. Now, there's a lady, Michelle Bullock, from... She's the Assistant Governor for Financial Systems at the the RBA, these sorts of outages disrupt commerce and erode trust of consumers in payment systems. Uh, Regulators are therefore starting to focus on the operational risks associated with retail payment systems and whether the operators and the participants are meeting appropriate high standards of resilience. These sorts of outages, yeah, and she just went on, blah, blah, blah. But it's good to see that, you know, they're looking at it because it's, geez, I I know the NAB went down not too long ago for a weekend or something, and they came to the party. They, Because uh, I know someone that had a merchant facility with them. I think NAB might have been down for two days or something like that, and they came to the party and gave, gave this, my friend anyway, gave them 900 bucks. So they really come to the party there. So I wonder what Telstra will do. Probably offer, offer, offer everyone a burnt stick and bring your own eye. But yeah. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so anyway, that's uh, so yeah. Did it, I don't know. Did you have, did it affect you, Joe? You didn't didn't come across any. I didn't didn't affect me. But no, it's, I didn't have any problems with that. No, no. But it's uh, it's just another one of these Telstra issues, isn't it? So it seems when they do have a problem, geez, they have a, a big problem, or is it just, or are they having a lot of little problems that we don't hear of, and then every now and then the big one comes. But anyway, uh, Telstra, a good news Telstra story. Okay, so they so they don't get too upset and. Turn me NBN further back. Uh, Telstra will let customers put consumer electronics on their mobile bills. So this is this sounds like a pretty good idea, I think. Uh, so what what you can do, what, what you'll be able to do, that Telstra will let you buy high end consumer electronics and add and add them to your bill. So add them to your Telstra bill and let you pay it off over twenty four months. So the products available through the new feature include smartwatches, speakers, headphones, and drones. Uh, can be bought with no upfront cost and paid for over a twenty month, a twenty four month period of uh, of your bill. So, you know, that's a I wonder how much that's going to cost. Uh, no, nothing, uh, nothing said there, but it's credit, so it's got to cost something. Um, customers, so they've got an example here. Customers who purchase a home or mobile plan can pay an additional thirty-two dollars per month for twenty-four months to receive an Apple Watch. Uh, though customers can only add up to five products, there are more than twenty products available at launch, including kit for, form the likes of Apple, Samsung, DJI. What's DJI? I don't know. And Telstra plans. Yeah. So blah blah blah. Uh, this is part of the Telstra twenty twenty two strategy that was released or you know, unveiled in June this year, uh, which one of the four main initiatives is to simplify the product for portfolio. And get this, the most drastic of these changes was the announcement that it would scrap 1,800 of its current consumer and small business plans and replace them with 20 core plans. Uh, that started rolling out in July. That's that's a massive scrapping, 1,800. Why would you have 1,800 plans? I know every time you ring up, it sounds like, you know, you, you ring up Department A, they've got their own plans. Department B got their own plans. Department C got their own plans. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe maybe it's a good idea. I mean, my dad still got on, on the old ten dollars a month plan by Telstra. Right. Yeah. What what sort of yeah. data does he get on that though? The, well, no. You know, years ago they had a ten dollars a month plan. I think it was available to anyone, and he was on that. Yeah. Yeah. 
and um, he never upgraded because he doesn't bother with data or anything like that. He just uses the phone mm. as a backup, really. He just you know, doesn't use it for every day. So and, he, um, yeah. they did try and uh, ring him a few times and say, hey, listen, you know, <laughs> we've got this new plan. You want to upgrade and blah, 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 blah. And he goes, oh, no, I'm quite fine like this. And he goes, but, you know, you can't stay on that plan all the time. He goes, oh, no, no, I'm quite fine like this. I mean, he, his bills, like, they don't send him a bill every month. They send him a bill every three months because they know that he hardly ever uses it. And it's like, you know, a couple of dollars here and there. Yes, right. Yeah, well, 10 bucks that's pretty good, isn't it? It's like, uh, has he got a passbook as well for the bank? Has he gone to statement accounts or has he still got his trusty little passbook as well? He still has his passbook, pass, little yeah. book as well. He's got no, he's got no internet access at home. Right, right, right. Because I, I, I have to look into doing something for him for that. Um, you know, he's missing out on on on, on the sport actually because Foxtel. He's got Foxtel at home, but Foxtel lost all the sports to Optus, mm. so therefore he he can't watch anything anymore. So I might have to sign him up to some sort of internet plan. But I remember but the, other, the other thing as well is he's because he's still on the ten dollars a month plan. Telstra have sent him a smartphone and said, oh. hey, here's this free smartphone. How about you pop off that plan and put a new SIM card in it and away you go. And, and he still didn't want it. He's still sitting in the box at home, the, the smartphone. So but the, what? So that wouldn't still mean $10 a month. They would have wanted to pop him up to at least 20 or 25 Exactly right. So yeah. what they've done, this is when the 2G shut down. Oh, yeah. He was using an old um, you know, little handset with the 2G still running on it. Yeah. He goes, oh, you can't use that anymore. So they, they sent him out a, a Huawei um, smartphone and uh, and a SIM card and said, here, grab this, put it in there, and away you go. And he didn't. He just kept. He just went out and bought another little you know, little handset with the push buttons on it, no, no <laughs> smartphone, no nothing. Yeah, my father-in-law did the same thing. He had that and, push and off. And that's it. Yeah. Still, and he's still on the $10 a month plan. Yeah, but you know, like ten dollars a month these days, it, it's probably it's it's not uh, overly cheap for Telstra. Like it's probably a, a pretty competitive plan. Like I know Aldi's got one for fifteen, so you know, like it's not. <laughs> it's probably still it's still ten bucks is ten bucks. That's pretty good. Um, yeah. So anyway, but yeah, for eighteen hundred. So what you're saying, Joe, is eighteen hundred plans that they're probably a lot of grandfathering plans going on yeah basically there's a lot of old services i mean even even with optus i, I guess you know but i think optus has been a bit more forthcoming with the saying, well you know we're going to drop you off this service and put you on this other service whether you like it or not whereas oh. with my dad they, they didn't do that they just said okay well they're trying to entice him with new phones and everything you just no nah, i want to stay here i don't see why they why they're not like apple they don't just say this is not working from here you got to move on because um, I've yeah, been. That's right. That, that, that's what Optus do. I th- if, 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 they, you know, when they upgrade you to a new plan, they automatically upgrade you. You know, in, in all fairness with Optus, they also they also give you the the same amount of plan and the same amount of money worth on the new plan, but they they change you from that old plan to the new plan. Yes. Yeah. I know. There's a yeah. There's a few times I've rang up Telstra and they've gone, uh, "You should be on this plan." I said, "Well, why haven't I heard about this?" You know, it's been out for six months. And they go, well, you got to do your own homework. But uh, anyway, so that's uh, what's going on there. Now, what you've been uh, reading Disney books or something, Joe. What's this Disney story you've got? Look, there's, there's this story here that, that Google and Disney have partnered, partnered um, to bring storybooks to life with um, the Google Home. Oh, yeah. So apparently um, what you do is you start reading out loud um, and the selected Disney Golden Books. The Google Home will then you know, give you sound effects to the soundtracks to accompany the story as you read it. You know, the feature apparently uses voice recognition to be able to tell when the reader has skipped ahead or gone back a page. Right. Yeah, and it adjusts the sound effects accordingly. So, you know, if you oh, I see. Yeah. So you know, but the the, the thing is. If you pause during the reading, um, you know, to talk about something or someone interrupts you, apparently the music gets um, gets you know, some sort of ambient music will start to play. Yeah. Until you start, until you start, um, start back up again. Start the story again. Yeah, so okay. The Google Mini, um, the Google Home, the Google Home Max speakers um, work with this thing. I'm not sure about the new Google Hub. 
that it hasn't been mentioned here that but i'm guessing that would probably be the next level mm. um now this sort of thing is only available in the u.s at the moment so you know you can say something like um you know hey google you know let's read a story um and then it'll start you know you, you tell it the name of the story and it starts and doing it the, the little sound effects as you start to speak yeah, that's yeah. pretty cool. When you first started talking about it, I thought you were going to say that the the Google device is going to read you the story, but no, this is a more yeah. In, so yeah, you're still... no, this is an actual mm. you know as you're reading a story too. So you, you know, your, your kids uh, they're still reading. If they got one in the room, you hear little ambient noises like, and then the crow went, Arr! and then the, the the thing will sort of say that you know the, yeah. the Google will say that they make the noises, and then you can you know like that's really cool. Now, yeah. the thing as well is that while this device is in story mode, um, you can't talk to it and say, can you do this and can you do that? Because all of those sort of things will be disabled during mm. during the story mode. I wonder if uh, they got uh, Graham Kennedy's crow call for that sound effect there, Joe. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't think so, somehow. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, yeah. So, you know, some of the things that they got there, some of the stories, um, they have Alice in Wonderland, Cinderella, um, Mickey Mouse and his spaceship, Right. Yeah, oh. Toy Story 3. Oh, yeah. Um, Peter Pan. Uh, Mickey Mouse goes to Christmas shopping is another one of the uh, stories that you can do. There's a couple of titles there I haven't haven't read. I have to yeah. Give it to I wonder now, if... having, having, you know, having that on the Google side, um, Alexa has also now, or Amazon actually has uh, partnered with HBO. Mm to provide um, animated children's uh, stories as well. Oh, right. Okay. So I wonder you know, how you were saying that it's only available in the US at the moment. Like, like my first question is, I don't know, why uh, my first answer or guess at an answer may be right, second maybe. I don't know, but so, but I wonder if you change if you, uh, you know, got your VPN going and and popped your Google out up in California. I wonder if you could if that would work. If you go read me a story and because you're out of California, it would work that way. I don't Maybe. know. That's interesting. It probably would work. Mm. Um, you might have to. I, then again, I don't know. At the same time, it might also recognise that your login is an Australian login from Australia, so therefore it might not. Mm. Yeah, but that's interesting. Like all these new things and different takes on things, and just technology mixing with everything. It's um, it's it's cool what's going on, isn't it? But that you haven't got one of those Google Hubs yet. No, um, I'm waiting for the price to come down a bit. I saw it uh, last week for 180 dollars. I think oh. it was gone down from 220 to 180. Yes, that's good, isn't it? Where was that at? That was at. Um, that's good. I saw it at the Good Guys, and it was still two twenty the other day, two nineteen or something. I think it actually was the Good Guys, right? Well, they must have added yeah, it. This is the one down in Sydney. I don't know if it's up the one in Queensland, yeah. or not. but this was like this week. Uh, this week, last week, it was on. Mm. It might have been a special for a few days. I'm not sure. Yeah, well, one eighty is getting down there. Uh, it's not going to appear in your Christmas stocking this year. No. My missus says, if you want it, you've got to buy it. <laughs> you spent your money on the email client. <laughs> That's right. Any, anything that um, I want to use for Joe the Gadget Man, it comes out of the Joe the Gadget Man budget. <laughs> no, that's no good. Yeah. Yeah. Works the same pretty much in this asshole too. But uh, anyway, that's, yeah. that's what happens. Uh, just, just with this um, children's thing, um, the Amazon Alexa has um, one called uh, Esme and Roy. Mm. And apparently this is like an adventure game that kids are able to pick up um, different adventures for Esme, who is a, a monster sitter. Right. <laughs> and with the friend Roy, who is a giant yellow monster as well. Now, in order to use this sort of thing, you need to um, have uh, an Alexa device, obviously, and you need to go into the skill section of the Alexa device and download or authorize the Alexa to be able to do this. Yeah, that's all right. Oh, that just reminded me of Esme from the country practice. There's your daddy old duck. Yeah, no, not that's Esme. <laughs> not the, wrong one, you reckon? <laughs> no, not that one. Right. But, I mean, if anyone um, just uses their uh, Amazon for their listening to music, 
you should actually go into the app and have a look at all these different other things that are available. I mean, with my one, I have this, um, again, it's called the, um, the skill set. You go into the skill set and it allows you to um, you know, enable, basically, it's already there. It's just a functionality and it now allows you to enable different things. And one that I've enabled is um, a music quiz. Right. Okay. And what was that in the Alexa, you were saying? Sorry, I missed Yeah, that. in the Alexa. Yeah, yeah right. What that does is it enables you... Actually, I'm, I've got it here. Do you reckon I should just show people what it does? Yeah, give it a pearl. I think those Alexas are pretty good, like for just from watching them on the on the block. I know they're probably all tweaked and, you know, um, spun to the highest efficiency and, and whatnot. <laughs> but, yeah. Alexa, let's play music quiz. Welcome to the music quiz. I will ask you five questions. Try to get as many right as you can. Just say the number of the answer you want to pick after I finish speaking. If you would like me to repeat a question for you, simply say, repeat. Let's begin with question one. Bonnie James Dio and Graham Bonnet both sang with which band? Mm. One, Black Sabbath. Two, U2. Three, Iron Maiden. Four, Rainbow. Rain, number four? That answer is correct. Oh, go Your Joe. Your is one. <laughs> Question two. In 1991, Madonna released which collection? One, Blonde Ambition. Two, no. Special. Nah. Three, Immaculate. Nah. Four, Pristine. Oh, no. Immaculate. Number three. That answer is correct. Was that Your Immaculate? Question three. Yeah, it was Immaculate. Rich Presley was a member of which band? One, The Jam. Two, Thin Lizzy. Three, Trogs. Four, Grateful Dead. Two. That answer is wrong. The correct answer is Trogs. Your score is two. Wild thing. Four. Wild thing. Singer songwriter Johnny Cash passed away in what year? Oh. One, 2016. No. Two, 1978. No. Three, 1994. Four, 2003. That one. Four. Four. That answer is wrong. Oh. The correct answer is 2003. Oh, that's Your what we said. Two. Question five. Stupid. Who had a 1952 number one hit with Here in My Heart? One. Al Martino, two, Tony Bennett, three, Les Paul, four, Mario Lanza. Mario. Two. <laughs> that answer is wrong. The correct answer is Al Martino. Aww. You got two out of five <laughs> questions correct. Thank you for playing the music quiz. Make sure That's... to play again to hear different music questions. That's pretty entertaining, I guess, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, so that's the sort of thing you can do with the Alexa. Yeah, that's pretty good. I know the uh, the the riddle room on the Google Home. Something's happened to that. That doesn't work as yeah. good See, as it used the, to. I, I haven't seen anything on the Google that does that. I mean, I haven't looked all that extensively, mm. but this seems to have it built in. So it sounds really good. Yeah, I mean, if, if it's good to have a bit of fun. And another thing that I've got programmed in it is um, sometimes I like to take a little Android quiz. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, so it, it goes through and it asks you all these different questions about Android. And again, you've got to select it out of one out of um, four, the yeah. answer. Yeah, no, yeah, okay, that's, uh, that's good. Uh, I'll, I'll just have to uh, listen to that over and over because I won't be buying an Alexa because, as you know, as we just said before, it comes out of the Aussie Tech Heads Fund, which <laughs> No exactly funds. right, yeah. So just like it comes out of the Joe the Gadget Man fund. That's right. That's it. They're both in debit. Um, Western Digital unveils world's first terabyte archive hard drive. So you think these hard drives get any bigger? Well, have a look at this 15 terabyte monster. And so there's a little picture of him there. So the drawback, I guess, is it's 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 um, it's proposed as an archive hard drive which means it's only it's not really suitable for reuse so it's more suitable for uh, storing of data that needs to be kept for long periods of time it's uh, designed for use with hyperscale cloud and data center workloads now it's the 
the SMR hard drives, which is the shingle magnetic recording uh, hard drives, are able to pack in higher storage capacities compared to a similar physical sized hard drive because the data can be stored on overlapping grooves. However, they're not really suitable for reuse, as we just said. The 15 terabyte Ultrastar DC HC620 hard drive can, can be combined together in a 4U60 hard drive enclosure, offering a total capacity of 900 terabytes. No good if you can't reuse them, though. But anyways, there, there must be some. What would you? What would you do? Uh, you could probably use them as in a data center, huge amounts of data, such as video surveillance or some sort of legacy information needs to be stored for regulatory compliance. That's a big word for this time of night. Um, Yes, I guess that's got its uses, but yeah, 15 terabytes, that's all right. I won't be getting one, but that's all right. Uh, 15 terabytes, that's a fair bit. I mean, I don't think I've got 15 terabytes worth of data on my server. No, no, I don't. I think I might have, uh, I haven't got eight, but I've got eight available. I might have about but, seven, but you can you can see the benefit in that. I mean, at the moment, if I if I am running a Windows ten machine, right, for all my server, and I've got four hard drives in there, or even five actually. Now, I, I guess if you get something like this, like a fifteen terabyte, or and you can like partition it into two different partitions. Mm. Now, I don't know, would that work if you partition that, say, fifty fifty, and create one as the um, your, your drive and then the other the other partition as a a backup to the to the original would that that would work wouldn't it well i'd say by what they're saying though is that the drive can only be used once like it, you can't rewrite so it's it's suitable for uh it says here how they're not really suitable for reuse so you wouldn't want to partition half because what you what are you saying you want to reuse it as a normal hard drive, one half? Or are you saying can you partition it just so for it to act as a lower capacity normal drive? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You know, make it make it partition it, make it fifty fifty and then use half of that for your storage and then back up the other half. Like as a backup as a backup. Oh, I see what you mean. So you sort of got two archives. Yeah. Right. <laughs> oh dunno. I don't know. Um and and and, I, and I'm not sure whether it'll work or not, but I guess it'll it'll probably run more efficiently. But why would you want to back up the same data on the same drive? Is that what you mean? Yeah, that's what I mean. I don't know. I'm just thinking, in case the, the data gets corrupted on one, you've got to back up on the other one. Yeah, well, I guess so. I guess if that if it, if you could make it work like that, it, you could. But then, like, if you get a physical problem with the drive, you've lost both. Well, if you get a physical uh, problem with the drive, then you're stuffed. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you're gone. Um, and, and by the way, I still haven't changed my hard drives as oh, well, Joe. and they're going on about almost ten years, and I'm really pushing it. I guess. Why? Why haven't you downloaded iDrive and at least, or Amazon's and stuck up uploaded all your stuff up there? Because I've been busy doing other stuff, I just couldn't be bothered doing that right now. I know I'm going to, I hope, hopefully, I don't regret it. I'll tell you, you'll be busy when they die. Oh, I know, I know. <laughs> you will be really busy. <laughs> we won't see you because you'll be crying for two weeks. <laughs> um, yeah, all right. So, uh, what else have you got, Jay? Anything else? Oh, no, that's it. You've done your Esma and Roy. You've yeah, done- the only other thing I can say is that FIFA uh, been hacked. Um, which is not really that, you know, people have been talking about it much, but apparently FIFA, um, the corporation was hacked um, earlier on in the, uh, earlier on, and um, apparently it had something to do with um, some phishing campaign. Right. Um, Did they catch any? Unsuspected uh, calls from a, an employee ah. who clicked on something on an email. Yep, there you go. And, That's um, what happens. That that released some sort of um, phishing um, hack, and they got some data off FIFA at the moment. FIFA at the moment. Hmm. Now, um, the ro- the results um, uh, are not being exposed as to what particular information has been um, gained by these hackers. But um, the last time FIFA got hacked, it had something to do with. Um, not sure if you remember the story of Cristiano Ronaldo and that supposedly case of where he supposedly had raped that woman. 
Oh, right. No, I haven't, I haven't heard of that. Yeah, that, that wasn't true, right? That mm. never happened. Um, but apparently the information came about from something that was hacked from FIFA. Uh, there's also another story uh, about Cristiano Ronaldo again, I think it was, where apparently he had something to do with taxes and something that right. also came out of there as well. Yeah, so, right. What's that sort of information doing on FIFA drives anyway? You know, oh, look, I don't know. <laughs> It's just, I don't know. It's just your data's everywhere and, you know, and nothing's exactly nothing's... right. I mean, I don't know. They're not disclosing what happened this time, but somewhere down the line, I'm guessing someone will have to say something as to what happened. Mm. The, the, the problem is that they, at least they know how it happened and yeah. they're trying to fix it. And the, the, the president of uh, FIFA is saying that they're doing all the, the regular checkups and and and, and uh, training and all that sort of thing sort of thing so it doesn't happen again yeah geez uh look uh, look my last one for the week to end on something uh cool i guess a 15 year old australian has been crowned overall champion at the fai world drone racing championships in Shenzhen, china and i don't know if this is actually his uh his gameplay but if you're on the video you can have a look at this this is cool isn't it drone racing uh best Beat over 127 other competitors of all ages from across the world to clinch the title as the four-day championship come to a close uh, later in the week. Take home, he received $33,350 for winning, along with a gold medal. So, nice work. It's good to see that the Aussies, representing Australian drone racing, doing good stuff over there in China. That's amazing how that, how those things can fly around like that. I mean, and being controlled by someone... You know, with a remote control. I mean, that's amazing that the, at the speed that they're traveling, even yeah, that you can still control it and get it to do what you want it to do. I yeah. mean, the, the latency on that must be zero. Yeah, it'd be pretty pretty fast, wouldn't it? Yeah, well, I suppose it. Well, they're saying that you know you can like you could potentially yeah the latency would be an issue, but you could potentially uh, you know race your drone on the other from the other side of the world. You'd have to have probably a couple of handlers when you stacked it. But, um, mm-hmm. yeah, drone racing is pretty cool. I, I I went on about it last year a bit or two years ago, so this is going to be the next big thing there, you, you know, betting on it and all this sort of stuff. It's, um, yeah, it's cool. All right. Well, I think that's about all we have for this week. Um, you got nothing else, Joe? I think. No, I don't have anything else this You're week. You're all good to go. Good stuff. Well, what I can say is that I won't be here next week. All right. Oh, well, that's, uh, that's no good. We'll have to get a, a stand-in or just be me and Jordan. If he's if he's finished with all his birthday parties, so all right. And what are you up to? Just having a week off? Anything you want to talk to us about? Well, I'll be just... down the Hunter Valley next week, so oh. I won't be able to do it unless I bring my laptop with me, which I don't think nah, is going to. Don't worry, just nah. get into that wine up there. Whereabouts up in the Hunter Valley are you going? Well, I don't actually know the name of the place because a friend of mine's booked a reservation. Right, um, I'm going down with him. So, oh, it's good uh, stuff. Uh, we're going to be doing some wine, wine tasting and some cheese and, and cracker tasting type thing as well. Yep, nice. We we're going to do the ballooning. Oh, you know, yeah. The hot air balloons. We were, we were going to do that, um, but apparently some price restriction type things, then we didn't do it. Hmm. Yeah, nice. Yeah, because that's right, because you're, oh, you're in Sydney, so that's uh, like about, what, two two, three-hour drive away? Yeah, about three hours, yeah. Yeah, nice. Yeah, cool. Good stuff. It's nice up there. Nice country up there. Yeah, all the grapes and everything. All right, lovely. Uh, you can get us on the Facebook, as we've said. You can get us on the YouTube. And uh, don't forget, you can also email us, Glenn or Joe, at aussietechheads.com.au. Uh, don't forget to check out athwebhosting.com.au and startnewcompany.com.au. And I think that's about all we've got this week. That's uh, nothing else. Uh, Jordan should be back next week. Thanks for everyone on the Facebook. Uh, I'll go through your, your comments and respond as needed after after we finish recording. And, yeah, good stuff. If you've got any questions or want to bring our attention to anything, pop it in the Facebook. And uh, I'll see if I can set up an automatic thing that will go, uh, I don't know, what, a day before, Joe? A day before the show? The day of the show? And Probably the day of the show, yeah. Probably just a – I mean, I, I, I have been so busy doing other things. So like I said, I never, never got the chance to send out a little – Thing half an hour before we normally do it to give people an idea on what we're going to be talking about. Yeah, that's all right. No worries. Well, let's see if I can yeah. figure something out automatically for my little questions. Yeah. Having said that, if anyone's got any ideas um, on what they would like us to talk about, they can always email us or message us in the Facebook. 
give us a few days' notice so that we can get up to up to the, up to speed with all the information that you require, mm. and we'll have a bit of a chat about it. Yeah, lovely. All right, good stuff. So that's it. So I hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, thanks, Facebook. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. And all, always thank you for downloading the podcast if that's how you listen through the audio. So until next week, uh, have a great week. Uh, spend a, a minute on the on Remembrance Day. Think about the soldiers and, uh, and whatnot. And I hope you have a good one. Until next time, see you then. See you, Joe. See ya. See ya.